glad to hear the honourable gentleman's optimistic uh, <laughs> assessment of my, of my growth plan. But I think he's entirely wrong. I think what we have to do is focus on growth. That's what we're doing, and that's what we will be delivering. Greg Clark. Thank you very much, indeed, Mr. Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's uh, statement. He's absolutely right to focus the Treasury on growth. One of the most important sources of that is to build on our excellence in science and innovation. So, will my right honourable friend uh, say whether he's still committed to reaching the 2.4% international average? Uh, for R&D investment by 2027 uh, and to achieve his target uh, of 20 billion by the end of this parliament. That, and I want to pay tribute to my uh, right honourable friend's uh, tenure in Bayes. Uh, he was a great uh, Secretary of State who really championed science. I uh, did uh, try to do the same in that post and I look forward to engaging with him on the science agenda going forward. John Tricky. Clear that the Chancellor's growth plan only grows one part of the economy, and that's the bankers' bonuses and the incomes of the richest in our society. And if the Chancellor really wants to cut through the cycle of low pay, poor productivity, and, and low economic growth, shouldn't he actually be abandoning his ideological commitment to trickle down economics and finally announce a massive public programme of investment in England and Britain's regions and nations? So, we, we do have a massive programme of investment, and it's called business and the private sector being able to mobilise capital to, to act in, in such institutions like investment zones. That's a really radical plan, and I was delighted to announce it this morning. Robert Halford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I strongly welcome the income tax cuts and the energy <coughs> Uh, rebates and the freeze, um, as well as the other cost of living measures, which will enormously help my constituents, many of whom are working seven days a week just to keep their heads above water. If I could just ask my right honourable friend, um, he knows that uh, petrol and diesel prices have been historic highs and that hauliers are pay have been paying up to £125 more every time they fill up, white van men and women filling up uh, £25 more every time they fill up uh, at the petrol stations. So will my right honourable friend, when he comes back and does a full budget, please do everything he can to cut uh, fuel duty, because as he's, he has made clear, he's a tax-cutting Chancellor. Yeah, I'd be very happy Chancellor. to engage my right honourable friend on that. I, I joined, uh, entered the House at the same time as he did, and I know that nobody has been more uh, tireless and unstinting in supporting uh, his constituents and lessening, focusing on lessening uh, the tax burden. Ali Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We welcome the Chancellor's targets to get back to levels of growth last sustained under a Labour government. Yeah, yeah. But under the Conservatives, the UK is currently forecast to have the slowest growth rate of any advanced economy next year. So can the Chancellor tell us what the OBR's estimate is of the impact of the me measures announced today on growth? Yeah, as I said, the OBR will come up with a full forecast uh, before the end of the calendar year. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, my right honourable friend is well aware of the great opportunities in northern Lincolnshire and, and the Humber region, particularly surrounding renewable energy, and I welcome his announcement uh, relating to investment zones. And I and the two uh, Conservative and local authorities in my constituency will want to work with him to deliver that. But even sooner, we can actually deliver on the Humber Freeports. Can he confirm that the Freeport uh, designation will continue and will he uh, unblock uh, the process that is delaying the uh, launch of the Freeport? The, the Freeports Just are certainly that. continuing, and I'll be very happy to speak to my honourable friend about how we can, as he says, as he puts it, unblock uh, the process to accelerate uh, the Humber. Uh, Freeport bid. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This budget amounts to an environment reckless charter, and it is also a statement of missed opportunities. For example, a report just this week shows that a major programme of insulating homes in Britain and installing heat pumps could benefit the economy by £7 billion a year, create 140,000 jobs by 2030, get our fuel bills down, get climate emissions down too. Tucked away in the growth report on page 14, there is a tiny reference to some investment in energy efficiency. It is nowhere near enough. Why is he setting his face against the kind of retrofit revolution that offers the only viable way out of the current crisis, as well as reducing our dependence on fossil fuels? Is it because, for him, dogma and deregulation trump evidence and common sense every time? Uh, it's not about dogma and deregulation. In fact, 
In terms of the eco and energy efficiency measures, I have uh, campaigned for them certainly when I was business secretary, and I made sure that there was, in fact, reference uh, in the growth plan uh, to the eco uh, plan. And we're going to uh, try, and we may well uh, expand that at a, at, a, at a future date. Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nuclear power must form part of a diversified energy portfolio. Can I welcome the measures that the Chancellor has announced today, particularly accelerating energy infrastructure? Can he just say a few words about whether his welcome package includes accelerating modular nuclear reactors? This is the future of the nuclear industry. Would you like to say a few words about that? Yeah, look, I was very Chancellor. focused, as he knows, uh, on SMR. Uh, production when I was uh, base Secretary of State, and it's something that I want to, uh, the, the thinking about that I want to bring into the heart uh, of the Treasury. There's still negotiations to be had, but he's absolutely right. SMRs, nuclear, that's part of our energy mix uh, in the future. Jess Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Um, can the Chancellor just confirm for me that he has just announced a tax cut that means someone earning £1 million will be £40,000 better off? That is more than a nurse earns and over £10,000 more than the average wage in Birmingham. Yeah. What, I, what I am going to concern, uh, confirm is that the top rate of tax, the top rate of tax has gone back to what it was before she entered the House, but when the party opposite was successful and winning elections. The top rate was for 20 years, and that's what we've gone back to. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth area, there is already an enterprise zone which has been very successful, though the land allocated needs to be adjusted to take advantage of the opportunities in the offshore energy and a revived fishing industry. Can my right honourable friend confirm that this existing enterprise zone will benefit from the opportunities that will be provided for the investment zones that he's announced? Chancellor? Uh, the enterprise zones, free ports, New investment zones will all benefit uh, from, uh, their, uh, the, from uh, tax reduction, planning, uh, relaxation, and of course, there will come a time when um, other zones, uh, other people, other places will want to become uh, investment zones. This is a huge opportunity uh, for communities up and down the country. Catherine McKinnell. Government and another growth plan. Yet the reality is the child poverty gap between the North East and the rest of the country is at a 20-year high. So can the Chancellor explain how giving these tax cuts to the most wealthy will put food on the table of children living below the poverty line in Newcastle this winter? When a recession uh, and economic downturns hit in the past, have hit in the past, the people most adversely affected are the most vulnerable in society. What that, that means that we have a duty to grow the economy and to make sure that we turbocharge growth. That's how we will help all of our constituents. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's statement and the return to low tax free market principles that we on this side know will lead to growth and prosperity for everybody in our country. Now, we know the role that the self-employed and entrepreneurs pay, played in growing the economy and getting us back to prosperity after the mess the party opposite made of the economy when they were last in government. So I was delighted to see the reforms to IR35 in my right honourable friend's statement. Can he confirm that with 12,000 registered self-employed in my constituency, those reforms will come quickly to give the self-employed of today, the entrepreneurs of tomorrow and the businesses that might contract their services the confidence to get on and grow? Yeah. Yeah. Chancellor. Absolutely, 100 per cent. Mr Oswald. Mr Speaker, this statement seems completely divorced from the realities of most people's lives. The, the Chancellor has made the, the choice to deliberately remove the cap from bankers' bonuses while deliberately ignoring the needs of people who are already struggling to make ends meet. So what is his message to these people, the people who are not going to benefit from his loving with the, the super rich? How does he think people are going to manage? Does the Chancellor just not care? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we had the energy intervention that was announced uh, last week and that we put, we put forward it, uh, that we've uh, mentioned today. We've got uh, uh, eco uh, schemes, we've got the warm homes uh, discount. We've had a reduction of council uh, tax A to, to D. There's a huge amount of intervention and we will always... My friend has made his intention to lift the 
bankers' bonus cap. But may I draw his attention to another uh, cap or threshold, the £40,000 uh, annual pension allowance, yeah. which is also causing uh, challenges, particularly to many experienced and senior public sector workers. Yeah. My right honourable friend will be aware of the challenges, NHS workforce challenges that uh, our health service currently faces. Yeah. Uh, and unless the, this is, issue is dealt with effectively, and we scrap the £40,000 annual allowance for defined benefit pension schemes, we are going to lose a lot of very experienced yeah. clinicians at a time when the NHS needs yeah, them yeah. the most. He can look at bankers' bonuses. Can he also look at this issue? Yeah, well, yeah, the issue has been Chancellor. raised. And it's not just a question of the annual uh, limit. It's also the lifetime uh, allowance. I mean, anecdotally, I hear that is also a big driver. The, the, the fact that it's been reduced successively over time is a big driver of people leaving uh, the profession. And that's something I'd be very happy to have a discussion with him about. Uh, in the future. Mohammed Jassid. While millions struggle with the cost of living, the Chancellor's first priority is to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses and tighten the rules on benefits for those who have the least. Yes. The government has already forgotten that the bonus culture led to the banking crash. Yes. Lowering regulations put in place to, to protect ordinary people and their pension is dangerous. This is Tory austerity all over again, making the rich richer and the poorest poorer. At the time when key workers are being denied a decent pay rise, so why has the Chancellor chosen to help with the wealthy chums? Chancellor, the focus of the growth plan is on growth. It's on getting our economy moving and getting to 2.5 per cent. That's the lens through which I am uh, looking at this problem, and I'd be very, very uh, happy uh, to remind him of support. Okay. Mr. Speaker, uh, growth sectors such as pharmaceuticals will no doubt welcome my right honourable friend's steps on corporation tax. Does he agree that supply side reforms are also required, with the Department of Health and Bayes working with greater urgency to approve and adopt? Uh, clinically proven medical treatments to more fully realise the potential of the UK life sciences sector. Very pleased uh, to confirm to my honourable friend that is exactly what we need to be driving forward. We need to be quick, uh, uh, accelerating uh, process so that we can actually deliver outcomes more quickly. And I pay tribute also to the fact that he and I have been debating, talking about these issues for many years now. And I'm very, very pleased that he still remains as focused uh, on growth uh, as he did uh, you know, many years ago. Stephen Furry. Uh, thank you. It may be a very uncomfortable truth for some, but the biggest barrier to growth at present is the fact that there's increased barriers to trade with our dearest neighbour in the European Union as a result of, of Brexit. And of course, there is an alternative reality here today as well, which would be a windfall tax, increased windfall tax on energy companies, investment in a Green New Deal, investment in skills and sound public finances. And how on earth can we look our constituents in the eye? Whenever they're only being offered £100 for home heating oil, whenever potentially people are going to get thousands in extra benefits today, the wealth is in our society. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're looking at the heating oil issue. My right honourable friend, the Business and Energy Secretary, is looking at, at this, and we will come uh, to a decision uh, on Northern Ireland, I think, very imminent. George Freeman. Madam Speaker, could I thank the Chancellor for putting growth at the heart of his mission in the Treasury and yeah, for challenging Treasury orthodoxy and making that the priority and in particular recognising the potential of Norfolk. Would he agree with me that there are different types of growth and we need growth that drives levelling up, strengthens the union, that drives innovation for higher productivity and that science, technology and innovation are fundamental to it. And would he agree with me, uh, echoing the comments of my right honourable friend, the Chair of the Science and Technology Select Committee, that we need the Treasury to move quickly to unlock private investment in fast-growing sectors. My honourable friend is absolutely right. I'd like to pay tribute to his uh, service as Science Minister when I was Secretary of State uh, in Bayes. We worked very closely together then, and I hope we can work closely now uh, to make sure that Treasury and other departments are as focused on the uh, science and technology agenda as my honourable friend. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Will the Chancellor give the important assurance that his predecessor gave that social security benefits will be fully uprated in the usual way in line with this month's inflation figure. <laughs> we will make announcements about that in due course. This is Helen Waitley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
Can I welcome my right honourable friend's focus and drive for increased economic growth yeah. and for making sure people get to keep more of what they earn? Yeah. Can I ask him to assure me as part of that that government will be absolutely focused as well on reducing the barriers that sometimes prevent people from working more and earning more, particularly skills and childcare? I think the childcare issue has been raised many times, and I'm looking forward to uh, more subsequent statements uh, from my uh, honourable, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education. That's clearly an issue which can unlock uh, uh, growth and also protect families, uh, so that they can go out and earn uh, money to look after their their family. I mean, that's really important. Tim Farron, Madam Deputy Speaker, surely the Chancellor understands that the cut in stamp duty will do nothing to help 99% of people who can't quite afford their own home. It will do huge amounts to incentivise people who want second, third, fourth and fifth homes in my constituency, in Cumbria and other rural parts of Britain. Does he not realise the damage that excessive second home ownership and non-permanent occupied dwellings does to communities like mine, those in Cornwall, those in Northumberland and the rest of the country? Will he listen to rural Britain and stop backing second home owners and back our communities instead? Uh, we are backing uh, your, uh, forgive me, his uh, communities. We are backing communities We're, by reducing taxes, by creating the potential for investment zones, by the energy intervention, a whole host of measures that are backing ordinary, hard-working people. Sir Robert Neil. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome much of the announcement. Can I, in particular, welcome uh, the change to IR35? As the Chancellor will know, that has caused real distress and injustice uh, to many honest, hard-working, self-employed people. Uh, I also welcome the uh, changes to stamp duty, but will he bear in mind, as I'm sure he does as a Conservative, that we also believe in sound money and that we must keep an eye upon inflation, because we do not want the benefit of the stamp duty cut to be eroded for many homeowners by the increased mortgage costs? Absolutely, and, th and he will understand. I mean, historically, if you look at uh, high bit periods of debt, we, 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 we manage to get out of that by growing our economy. That's why we've got a renewed focus on growth. What we can't do is simply tax our way uh, to prosperity. That has never happened before. Barry Shearman. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I inform the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer that that was probably the most disappointing yep. presentation I've had since my, I came into the House since 1979. And the fact of the matter is, what exactly is he hiding? Is he hiding the fact that what he's announced today will mean that in the future my children, our grandchildren, will have to pay the price of what he's announced today. Isn't that the truth? We're going to put this borrowing on future generations and that will blight the whole future of that generation. What I find extraordinary, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that people on the benches opposite stood on a, a platform of pure, unadulterated socialism in 2019, which was totally reckless, totally reckless, and had no interest in the private sector. What we're doing is putting more money into the pockets of people and businesses. That's what drives growth. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, is it not the case uh, that already the Chancellor's intervention to freeze energy bills is predicted to reduce inflation by five percentage points? And that for every single percentage point that inflation comes down by, it reduces our borrowing costs by £6 billion. And therefore, by simple economics, which the party opposite need a bit of a lesson, it is entirely feasible that within the G7 we have. It makes this growth strategy entirely, entirely plausible. Uh, he's absolutely right. Because of careful stewardship of the fi public finances, we can, withstand, we can withstand the exogenous shocks represented by COVID-19 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have got the second lowest debt, net debt to GDP in the G7, and we will use uh, our position, our fiscal position, to help the most vulnerable in society. Yeah. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Since the Chancellor came to his feet, the value of the UK government bonds has plummeted, yeah. which will yeah, yeah, yeah. put the national debt yeah. into a serious crisis for generations to come. Yeah. How is he going to mitigate that? Check it yourself. Yeah. Check the, the, market, the, uh, the markets 
uh, uh, react as they will. But the, gro- but the growth plan, the growth plan, will uh, very soon show show that we're on the right course and that we're steering us to a more prosperous future. Matt Warman. Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, I welcome the focus on putting rocket boosters under Britain's brilliant technology sector in the Chancellor's budget. But those internet businesses are open 24 7. This is a deregulating government. I wonder if the Chancellor would look at deregulating Sunday opening hours so that we can compete on the high street just as we can compete on the internet. We, we, we've looked at this in the past. It was not without controversy, but I'd be very happy to hear his ideas uh, in this, on this subject. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor argues, on the one hand, that those on the lowest incomes, people on universal credit, should face the threat of their income being reduced further in order to boost economic growth. While, on the other hand, he says to people already on the highest income, bankers, that they need an increase in their income through their bonuses in order to do the same. Yeah. How on earth is that fair? Yeah. So, just a, a very basic lesson. We tax, we tax bonuses, we tax bonuses currently at about 50%, and that goes into public services. And it's absolutely legitimate to get more people into the labour market. That seems a reasonable thing to want to do. Virginia Crosby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As Chair of the Anglesey Freeport Bidding Consortium, I am delighted with the announcement of new investment zones by the UK Government. Can the <coughs> Chancellor say what this means for Honest Morn and its Freeport bid, especially with the deadline to submit by the 24th of November? Honest Morn has great, a fantastic uh, Member of Parliament, and my honourable friend. And we are also not only focused on freeports, but on nuclear, the future of nuclear. And Innos Morn represents a hugely exciting opportunity uh, in that regard. Andrew Gwynn. So the Chancellor has admitted that the last 12 Tory years. <laughs> but the real, the real impact of this budget is that we are piling on debt for future generations. It's unaffordable. And if the Chancellor were a local councillor presenting this as a budget, his monitoring officer would be issuing him with a Section 114 notice and his ministers would be calling in the commissioners. So the focus is on growth. As my honourable friend said, our net debt to GDP ratio is low compared to G7 and we are 100% focused on growing the economy so that future generations will be uh, able to deal with the the fiscal shocks that they uh, have to deal with. That's what the purpose of this is. Sarah Brickler. Speaker, getting through key infrastructure projects and the announcement of investment zones whilst helping families and businesses with their energy costs is key for people in Haven and Haslingen. But Lancashire has been announced as an area that can be an investment zone, but there are significant differences and problems between West Lancashire and East Lancashire. So could the Chancellor say whether it is possible for areas to have two investment zones in a county? Chancellor of the Exchequer. Absolutely. I mean, there's no reason why we can't have lots of different investment zones dotted around in lots of areas in the country. The, the deluxe sector is uh, conversing and engaging in conversations as we speak uh, with various local authorities to see whether they can accommodate investment zones. Amy Callaghan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was not aware new legislation was introduced during a fiscal statement announcing a plan to this House to annihilate workers' rights during a statement framed at supporting our constituents and these very workers through the energy crisis is a new law even for a Tory government. I would say this government, but the the faces change on these these benches that often that I can't possibly (laughs) possibly see this government. I would ask if he would scrap these plans, but these are not the plans of a Chancellor. The, isn't it the case that they are the ill-thought-out plans of a power-hungry Tory leadership candidate and they must be scrapped? Yeah, yeah. 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 Haven't, I didn't mention anything in my uh, uh, statement on workers' rights, and I've always been very focused on, 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 the, on, broader, on broader workers' rights. And, uh, and, and, 
No, the right to strike. No, the, the, the minimum service levels are absolutely crucial to make sure that the public is protected from militant trade union action. It's entirely fair. It's what happens in Europe, and we are 100% committed to that. Anthony Higginbottom. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I welcome the Secretary of State's focus on growth, which will allow businesses in Burnley and Paddington to grow and allow people to keep more of the money they earn. Following on from my honourable friend, the member for Hindburn, in East Lancashire, we stand ready to lead this country in aerospace, in cyber, in small modular reactors. So can I urge the Chancellor to look sympathetically on a bid from East Lancashire? And would he meet with myself and other East Lancashire colleagues and the leader of Lancashire County Council to talk about what East Lancashire investment zone might look like? So, uh, just to remind my honourable friend, uh, the investment zone conversations have been very much led by the DLUC uh, Secretary of State. I'm sure he will be engaging uh, with uh, uh, the, the relevant councils. And I'd be very happy also to talk uh, to my honourable friend about the opportunities that investment zones uh, represent. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I just take the Chancellor back to his party's manifesto commitment around levelling up? And what I want to know is, the investment zones, will they actually tackle the need for real infrastructure investment? So, for example, if he's really serious about growth, the need for the rail electrification line to Hull, which was ruled out in his party's integrated rail plan just last November for the next 30 years, Will he look at that again if he's yeah. serious about growth? Yeah. Yeah. We're always Checker. looking at infrastructure projects and measuring their uh, benefit cost uh, ratio. And of course, as far as investment zones are concerned, of course, they're naturally allied to key bits of infrastructure and they have to be coordinated. That's one of the purposes of, of what we're trying to announce. Mike Wood. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Investment zones have potential to make a massive contribution to levelling up for areas like Dudley South. But can the Chancellor reassure my constituents that the, uh, the more liberalised planning regulations won't mean the communities have to sacrifice the precious uh, green belt as the price for an enterprise zone? It's absolutely right. The, the, the whole premise and basis of the investment zone conversation is mutual consent. There has to be a mutual consent. They won't be imposed in any area. And absolutely, locals, uh, local uh, residents will have... Uh, and councils uh, will have a huge say in terms of how the investment zone develops. Jeremy Corbett. Would the Chancellor of Exchequer explain where is the morality in giving a huge increase in income to the very richest in our society and threatening the benefits of the very poorest in our society who are trying to get by on universal credit? What estimate has he got? of the levels of inequality that will exist in this country in one year's time and in five years' time as a result of his statement today. It is always our duty to help the most vulnerable in society. That's why we've had the energy uh, uh, intervention. That's why we had the COVID-19 pandemic uh, intervention. But also, it is, it is incumbent on the government uh, to try and seek to enable growth. And that's what we're focused on too uh, in this plan. Sean Bailey. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, uh, my, I welcome our right in position and you will know from his previous portfolio that high intensive energy industries have been acutely affected by the rising cost of energy prices so I do welcome the government's intervention around energy prices but what we need to see in the black country particularly in our advanced manufacturing and metals industries Madam Deputy Speaker and this point was stressed yesterday to our right honourable friend the Business Secretary is to ensure that there is continued communication between the Treasury and obviously the Department for Business so can my right honourable friend just reassure me that those discussions will be ongoing and he will assure that as circumstances perhaps change for high intense energy industries Madam Deputy Speaker that the Treasury remains open to carry on that dialogue. Uh, he will appreciate that as uh, Bay's Secretary I was very focused on energy intensive industries I did engage uh, Treasury colleagues uh, then, and now I am in the Treasury. I'll be very happy to engage base uh, colleagues on this pressing issue. Chris Bryant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It must surely be the definition of chutzpah to come to the House of Commons and complain about high taxation and low growth when you voted for 15 increase in taxation and you've been the business secretary who has taken the UK into recession. It must surely be the definition of chutzpah to come to the House of Commons and say that you believe in sound money when you've just put £72.4 billion on the Never Never um, credit card for the country. Let me just explain to him why people in the Ronda might think he's got this wrong. 
We don't have any bankers begging for additional uh, bonuses in the Rhonda. We don't have anybody, I would guess, earning more than £150,000 in the Rhonda. But we do have a lot of families whose energy bills have doubled, even after what he's done, have doubled this year and will be going into energy poverty, who are seeing food prices going up by 15% and petrol prices locally going up even more. That's why we think he's a disgrace. Oh, no, we, need, we, need a, we need a question. If there was no question, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer can't answer it. I'm not sure there was a question. I'm not sure there was a question. Uh, we've, we've got to focus on growth. And through growth, we get more tax revenue to pay for public services. That's a very fundamental uh, notion, and that's what we're focused on. Selene Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's focus on productivity. Will he also be using fiscal levers to tackle the productivity of housing stock in tourist locations like my North Devon constituency, which sees winter ghost villages as second homes and holiday lets sit empty, resulting in local businesses having to close? and endless businesses unable to recruit their good jobs as there is nowhere to live. I'll, I'll absolutely be focused on that. I'd be very interested to hear more detail uh, with, uh, in a conversation with her to discuss what more we can do uh, to, to, to free up uh, the property market. Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And with your forbearance, I'd like to pass on to the House the sad news of the passing of my predecessor, Jim Sheridan. He diligently served uh, the constituents of Paisley North and Rimshire West, then Paisley and Rimshire North for 14 years, and I'm sure uh, the whole House's thoughts are with his wife Jean and his family and friends. Uh, now, Madam Deputy Speaker, Jim and I didn't agree on everything, uh, I think it's fair to say, but I'm certain that he and I would certainly agree wholeheartedly on the Chancellor's shameful and regressive statement. Uh, workers' rights were important to Jim, as they are to me, so the further attack on those rights uh, announced today is to the Chancellor's shame. Uh, but he spoke of the riddle of growth. So I wonder if he could riddle me this. How is it that giving bankers yet more millions drives economic growth, but giving those on benefits a fair deal or those on low wages a cost of living pay increase drives inflation? Just before I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to answer the question, um, may I, on behalf of the whole House, pass on to the family of Jim Sheridan, who was a much respected member of Parliament here for a very important constituency, um, uh, the, the condolences of the whole House. Yeah. Chancellor of the Exchequer. I'll, I'll say very quickly that if bankers are working in London, they are taxed in London. If they move out of uh, the UK, they're taxed uh, elsewhere, and we don't see a penny of uh, tax revenue. The City of London. The financial service is not just about the City of London, it's about Edinburgh, it's about a whole range of other countries, uh, or other uh, towns, uh, have to be at the top, uh, at, the, at, at, the, at the apex of the financial system, global financial system. We've got to attract the talent exactly. and we can tax it, and that tax revenue is used to public services. Craig McKinley. Speaker, can I offer my, um, well, absolute congratulations for the Chancellor's growth plan. And uh, he will know that my interest is in tax. The Register of Members' Interest will show that. And I'm delighted that we're seeing lower taxes and simpler taxes. And I think it would be fair to say that this party's you know, inheritance of saying we're a party of low taxes had become somewhat opaque and confused over recent years. I wondered if he would agree with my very simplistic summary of what he is saying today that this party believes in taking a smaller percentage out of a bigger pie rather than the state nicking more out of a static and diminishing pie, which seems to be the message of the party opposite, except for the DUP, of course. I mean, we, we, we openly repudiate a socialist vision of society. We don't believe that the state should take more and more of people's income. We think that people should keep more and more of their earnings. Nick Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor has sacked his Permanent Secretary, muzzled the Office for Budget Responsibility and is man-marking the Governor of the Bank of England. <laughs> his freewheeling ideology is crushing dissent. So can I ask the Chancellor, will the Governor of the Bank of England still be in his job by Christmas? The Governor of the Bank of England is entirely independent and I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman that we actually have struck uh, some very good relations. We speak regularly. I think that's a good thing. He might think that's man-marking. I think it's very cordial. Uh, and we're exchanging ideas. And that's what we uh, intend to do. Nick Fletcher. 
Yeah, Madam yeah, Deputy yeah, Speaker, yeah, yeah. and I welcome my honourable friend into his place. After decades of neglect and, local and low aspiration <coughs> under local opposition control, on behalf of the whole of Doncaster, I welcome this statement. If Peel Holdings today do the right thing, we will have saved our airport, and with low taxes at airports, an investment zone, and a grant from Bayes for the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, Aspiration Doncaster can be achieved and levelling up will be delivered, delivered, delivered. So will the Honourable Member please meet with me and look at all the opportunities that are available from this statement for the people of Doncaster? I would be very happy to meet with my Honourable Friend and discuss the opportunities represented by investment zones and other of our policies. Matt Rodder. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor has clearly put the interests of large energy firms ahead of those of families and small businesses. Isn't that why he's unwilling to publish the OBR's report? Chancellor. That isn't uh, true at all. We've actually intervened in a way that no government has done or, uh, to protect people from uh, gas price spikes. We've also um, focused on expanding supply. So I'd like to ask uh, members opposite their view on North Sea oil, North Sea gas. We're actually expanding. We're actually expanding that, and that's something that we're proud to do to expand capacity to reduce prices. Jane Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. May I first of all congratulate my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, on an excellent speech and real focus on growth for this yeah. country. We are a nation of small businesses, both people who own those businesses and the employees uh, who work there. And this, you've really, really listened, I would say, Chancellor, uh, to those small businesses and understand the issues that they're facing. Um, given you've achieved all of this in only two and a half weeks, I'm wondering if you could. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the Chancellor could uh, could let us know the likely timescales and could they be just as quick on uh, the repeal of IR35 and business rates reviews. Thank you. I think we made announcements on IR35. Uh, I made an announcement this morning. I'd be very interested to hear her ideas on business rates because that's an ongoing conversation and I used to hear that the whole time when I was PPS to the Chancellor five years ago and also as Chancellor, as you say, as she says, for two and a half weeks. Wendy Chamberlain. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to know how this Conservative plan for growth is going to help unpaid carers, who Carers UK estimate deliver £500 million worth of care a day. While I've been speaking to constituents in North East Fife about my carers' leave bill, it's clear that carers' allowance prevents people from working. So, given that the Chancellor has failed to ensure or clarify whether we're going to see inflationary increases for benefits, will they at least look at ensuring that they don't impact with other benefits, or at the very least allow people to work more before their carers' allowance is impacted? Yeah, we're, all, we're always looking Chancellor at ways in which we can encourage uh, people who are helping the most vulnerable in society do what is a critically important job. We're always looking at ways how we can improve that. Dr Ben Spencer. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. What's been announced today is more than just a fiscal event. It's a vote of confidence in Britain. A statement to the country that we can grow, we can aspire and we can achieve. Rather than wilt in the face of our challenges, we can and we will flourish. Does my right honourable friend agree? He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. We have a dynamic uh, population, high, highly skilled people, and our job in government is to empower people uh, to grow and to achieve and to thrive in the way he suggested. Neil Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Well, during the last 12 years of Tory government, public services have been cut to the bone and are now facing rampant inflation and escalation of costs. So, following his announcement, what reassurances can the Chancellor give that there will be no real terms cuts to the budgets of our public services? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to make any statements Chancellor. about uh, a budget here. Uh, uh, this afternoon, this morning. That's the cuts are coming. Jerome Mayhew. Madam Deputy yeah, yeah, Speaker, yeah. without growth, government just becomes an exercise in rearranging <coughs> the debt chairs. So I absolutely welcome this unashamed focus on growth because, as the Honourable Member for Runnymede and Weybridge said, it's a vote of confidence in the future of our country. Let's look at the Western Link Road in my constituency. 
Does my right hon. Friend agree that the decision to accelerate that project is exactly the kind of enabling infrastructure investment that helps local communities and unlocks local economic growth? My hon. Friend is absolutely right. By accelerating infrastructure projects, we can generate economic growth, we can generate uh, achievement, we can uh, su- uh, infuse the supply chain and actually get Britain moving again. Marion Fellows. We want this country to be an entrepreneurial, share-owning democracy. I now want to extend an invitation to our recent, well, current Chancellor and, uh, to come to Motherwell Town Centre and wish across and try and explain this pie-in-the-sky ideology to folk in my constituency who are scared to go to sleep at night in case they can't wake up and heat their houses the next day or feed their families. Where do you think this ideology is going to help those constituents of mine? It's not not ideology. It's a practical practical focus on growing the economy so we have a more prosperous country. That's what governments should be doing. And the uh, party opposite, the socialism that she, I don't know whether she represents that, isn't going to work. Simon Baines. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I congratulate my right honourable friend on his focus on growth in his statement? And would the government consider a cross border investment zone on the Welsh borders covering North East Wales, where my constituency of Clwyd South is located, and part of North West England, given the very close economic interrelationship between the two areas? Chancellor the Exchequer. Um, as I've said to uh, other colleagues, the uh, DLUC Secretary of State, my right honourable friend, is very much engaging with uh, local councils on where these investment zones can be located. But I'd be very happy to speak to my honourable friend about uh, looking at possibilities where we could uh, locate investment zones in the region he suggested. Matt Western. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, since uh, uh, people close to the Treasury Uh, started trailing details about this mini-budget over the last 10 days. Sterling has lost 5% in value against the dollar. Uh, Hasn't he just fired the starting gun on a run on the pound? I know it's fashionable for um, members opposite to talk down Britain and talk down, and they're they're showing, showing, I have to say, they're showing an extraordinary interest. They're showing an extraordinary interest in the gyrations of markets. What, what will uh, improve uh, market sentiment is strong growth and, uh, and a Britain that's open for business, and that's exactly what we're trying uh, to achieve. Scott Bed. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thousands of my constituents will welcome this statement, which will see the average working family in Blackpool over £1,500 per year better off through the combination of tax cuts and the energy price guarantee. They will also welcome the opportunities this could present for jobs and investments in the new enterprise and investment zones. How quickly can we roll one of these out in Blackpool? Um, I would be very interested to have a conversation with him about this and also refer him uh, to my right honourable friend, the DLUC uh, Secretary of State. He is engaged with these conversations as we speak. Clive Betts. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. So, after 12 years of failure, the answer apparently is to first of all blame workers and their trade unions, and then to blame the planning system, the system they've been responsible for for the last 12 years. Will the Chancellor explain, with regard to these new investment zones, which sound rather similar to the failed enterprise zones of the 1980s, what planning requirements are going to be abolished? Will that include the abolition of the requirement to build affordable homes for those that can't afford to buy? And has he done a detailed cost-benefit analysis of the proposals? Oh, if so, will he put that assessment in the library by the end of today? Uh, The investment zones, as I said, the core principle of them is consent. They won't be imposed on people. And actually, the enterprise zone, as I look at places like Canary Wharf, there were successes. There have been successes uh, of the enterprise zone, and I think the investment zones also uh, will be successful and look back uh, uh, fondly. Aaron Bell. 
Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I welcome my right honourable friend, the Chancellor's statement? But more than that, could I welcome the clarity of his philosophy? We cannot tax our way to prosperity. Yeah. We, need, we need economic growth. And could I also welcome the principle that my Newcastle underlying constituents will get to keep more of their own hard earned money, both through the national insurance cancellation and through income tax? And could he set out how much better off a typical 30,000 a year earner will be because of the measures he set out today? Yeah. It will be hundreds of pounds uh, better off. Uh, the, the 1p rate is the £330 uh, benefit. Um, the energy intervention is roughly £1,200 uh, per household. People uh, uh, all across our society will benefit from this approach that we're adopting. And as my honourable friend reminded the House, and the socialists never have understood, you cannot tax, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, you cannot tax your way to prosperity. Seymour Moral Hartra. It's already clear that this desperate bid for an economic bounce after a decade of failure is not based on a plan for growth, but a wing and a prayer that if the rich get richer, then all will be well. It comes at the price of higher borrowing and inflationary pressures that will result in interest rates and mortgage rates going up. So as he brings in large tax cuts for the already well-off, what is his message to his mortgage-paying constituents and mine? Stuck on high interest rates, particularly those who are mortgage prisoners with SVRs they cannot change, who will be seeing their mortgage payments rise further and faster with his policies threatening the very home ownership he says he supports. So, um, the, the stamp duty mill band doubling is helping uh, people buy a home. The, uh, in, in her constituency and mine, there is an increase in the threshold uh, as around the country, but that will help lots of people buying a home. The energy intervention uh, will help her uh, constituents and, and my constituents, and the reduction in the basic rate will also help many of her constituents. Ben Bradley. Yeah. Yeah. A Conservative yeah. Chancellor announcing that he intends to let people keep more of their own money and choose for themselves how to spend it. How refreshing, yeah. Madam yeah. Deputy yeah. Speaker. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also pleased that Nottinghamshire has been able to be part of early conversations about investment zones. Now, the county is also on the final shortlist for step nuclear fusion investment. Imagine for a second, Madam Deputy Speaker, that huge infrastructure investment in the future of our domestic energy supply, supported by the incentives and the growth opportunity of an investment zone. We have some vision in Nottinghamshire, yes. Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it will require government departments to talk to each other. Can the Chancellor help? Absolutely. We fully intend, uh, while I'm in the Treasury, certainly to talk to departments to deliver the vision that I know he's driving in his constituency. Chiel Moore. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Newcastle paid a very heavy price for Conservative austerity mm. economics. Wages cut, public services slashed, growth stifled, businesses closed, good jobs lost. We were told there was no money to invest in no the North East regional economic growth. Now he is borrowing billions to gamble on tax cuts for the rich and boosting oil companies' profits. Still, working people are expected to foot the bill. So will he apologise to my constituents for making them poorer and expecting them to pay for it? Yeah. So the, the, the tax cuts Jeff we've Jeff. announced, I've announced, affect everybody uh, pay, who pays tax, and they will, and they, and they will affect, many, affect many, many people in her constituency. And I'm very, very pleased that through levelling up, we are now focused uh, particularly on driving growth right across our country, particularly with investment zones. I look forward to the investment zone. Yeah. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm sure many of my Edinburgh South West constituents will agree with me that threatening the low paid with sanctions while ensuring that bankers can get bigger bonuses is not a moral way to go about creating growth. Before the Chancellor says that Edinburgh will somehow benefit from this, can I assure him that most of my constituents that work in the financial sector will not benefit from these bonuses. Yeah, yeah. But not content with doing that, he's also attacking the right of low paid people to strike to get yeah. better pay mm -hmm. and conditions. Now, the European Court of Human Rights has recently reaffirmed that under Article 11, the right to strike is a fundamental human right. So can the Chancellor answer me this question? Can he assure me that any legislation the government brings forward concerning strike rights will comply with the United Kingdom's treaty obligations under Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Yeah. The right to strike, there were two measures I referred to in this respect. The right to strike will not 
uh, be compromised by minimum service levels, nor is it compromised by requiring uh, union bosses to put a ballot to their entire membership ahead of a strike. These are not measures which uh, conflict or in any way uh, militate against the right to strike. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a budget, and it should have been treated as such by the Chancellor. Mm, yeah. yes. It is the budget which is lining the Savile Row pockets yeah, of yeah. their friends and allies in the city and their funders in the city yeah. too. Who's paying for this? Is it the oil uh, companies making millions no. and billions? Is mm -hmm. it the mega corporations making millions and billions? No, it is working people. Will he admit it? Yeah, yeah. What I will admit, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the plan is a plan for growth that's going to drive entrepreneurialism and endeavour and uh, uh, economic opportunity in this country, and everybody will benefit from it. Very good. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Whilst the Chancellor was speaking so optimistically about growth, the city saw the FTSE 100 fall, yeah. the S&P 500 fall, and the pound and, and the pound and the pound fall, the pound fall to the lowest level since 1985. <laughs> now he will appreciate that, given that oil and gas prices on the wholesale markets are in dollars. That has just increased still further the borrowing that he will have to pay for the package announced yesterday. Yep. But if he is so optimistic about growth, will he set a time scale? Will that time scale be six months? Will he retire in a year if the growth that he has predicated hasn't been achieved? Or is this an admission that he's going to stuff as much money into as many of his friends' pockets yeah. before the general election yeah. in 2024? Yeah. 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 He, he, he will also know that over the last two or three months, oil and gas prices have come off uh, quite a bit. So actually, the long-term contracts we're negotiating are just as likely to be uh, much less costly uh, than increased in costs. And of course, in terms of our growth plan, I'm not embarrassed about wanting to grow the uh, British economy. I'm not embarrassed about driving opportunity in this country, and I don't believe that higher taxes lead to prosperity. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. For the first time ever this year, the number of women aged 25 to 34 leaving the workforce to care for children is going up. Four in ten mothers have considered giving up work or cutting their hours because of the cost of childcare. More than a third of parents of primary age children are in part-time work. Why does the Chancellor think that bearing down with punitive sanctions on the lowest paid working parents who work part-time will help them increase their hours, when what they really need is an accessible, affordable childcare system fit for the 21st century? I think she's absolutely right to identify childcare as a crucial issue. And that's something which I'm looking forward to my uh, uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education, to update the House uh, in the next few weeks. Ian Lavery. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Within seconds of the Chancellor's uh, financial statement, he declared war on the trade unions. He declared war on those less well off in society, those on universal credit, at the same time um, scrapped but they the cap on bank and bonuses. That's ideology. That's ideology unfettered. Can the Secretary of State say who will benefit most from the huge financial intervention that day? Will it be someone on a salary similar to the right honourable honourable gentleman or someone like in my constituency, a, a two uh, two parent family with two kids who are having to use or having to claim universal credit to top up their income. So uh, the energy intervention will help all his constituents deal with higher energy costs this winter and the uh, reduction in the basic rate which we've pulled forward one year will also help people to the tune of £330 a year. That's a broad swathe of our countrymen and women. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. One group who never get a mention in fiscal events from this government are millions of unpaid family carers. Yeah. There's no increase here for their miserly £67 a week carers allowance. If they work part-time, as we've already heard from other colleagues, this government is threatening them with sanctions if they don't increase the hours they work. Cost of living help? 
only £150 to help disabled people and their carers. That won't even scratch the surface. So I asked the Chancellor what his plan with tax cuts for the highest earners says to those who do that vital work of caring for vulnerable and disabled people. He told the Honourable Member for North East Fife earlier that he wants to take opportunities to help them. He hasn't taken an opportunity to help them. Yeah. We have. I mean, two uh, measures. We've reversed the national insurance increase, which uh, cut, was a tax cut for 28 million people, worth £300 a year. We've also brought forward uh, the, the reduction, uh, 1p reduction in the basic rate to 19p, which is also helping people to the tune of £330 a year. That's help to lots and lots of our constituents. Chris Law. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm actually quite astonished because I don't think I've received a single letter from any constituents that are saying, from a fat cat or any geologist or of the richest 1%, please help us with the cost of living. <laughs> <laughs> However, what I have had is a bag full of constituents write to me about the cost of living and what help there would be in this package. Those of which the most vulnerable in our society, the disabled. It seems that given where we're at just now, disabled are having to choose heat over eat, they're losing out in therapies, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society next week will be publishing a report which will show that 40% are going into a real deep crisis this winter and not a single package has been announced. So can I ask the Chancellor of Exchequer, what package are you going to put forward for the dis disabled people in our society that we all care for, yet not a single word is in this budget? Yeah, yeah. We do uh, care for Absolutely. the most vulnerable in our society. That's a, a duty of government. That's a moral duty uh, of government. And we have uh, me announced measures in the energy space, which is helping a whole range of people, a whole range of people, which is fundamental to the cost of living in terms of tackling bills this winter. Toby Perkins. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. The pound has reached its lowest rate uh, against the dollar in the time that the Chancellor has been on his feet. The FTSE 100 index is down 1.7% uh, simply today. Now, when my honourable friend from York Central <coughs> raised it with me, he said, well, the markets will react as they will. But if the point of his plan for growth is to increase confidence, and even the city believes stuffing the pockets of the very wealthiest and expecting bankers' bonuses and uh, oil company profits to lead the rest of us to prosperity is a bad idea, who is actually on his side? The growth plan is about growing the economy. And we're not going to grow the economy by increasing taxes indefinitely. Mike King. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The uh, Chancellor <laughs> mentioned that, that it would cost £60 billion for his energy package for just six months. But the Prime Minister promised that that package would go on until 2024. £240 billion pound borrowing requirement to fix a broken energy market today, saddled on future generations. Can I ask the Chancellor, does he think that's a price well worth paying? So I think he's got the mathematics slightly wrong. The, the, the business support is six months and the household support is for two years. Uh, so those are two things that need to be disaggregated. And of course, in terms of long-term pricing, nobody in this room, nobody in the world has any idea what the forward uh, uh, price will be or what the price will be in two years. So it would be pr uh, misleading to put a price on that. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Not just the American president, but the dogs in the street know that trickle-down <laughs> economics doesn't work. Here, here, here. What this statement does is push money into the pockets of bankers in the City of London and big fossil fuel companies. Mm -hmm. It will kill high streets. Mm -hmm. It will take money away from local economies. And to depend the entire UK economy on one big city while strangling everywhere else yep. is the opposite of levelling up. Here, here. This document claims on page 32 that the price cap of 2,500 will bring down the average household bill <laughs> to 2,500. That's still £600 more yeah, yes. than yep. it is now and double what it was in January. Yep. So what will yep. the Chancellor do to help people right now and will he particularly cut VAT on fuel as Germany has done? The, the investment zones uh, and uh, our ability to uh, motivate, incentivise uh, investment is going to help uh, a whole swath of communities across the UK. The reversal of the national insurance tax and the uh, bringing forward of the 1p reduction also will help 
uh, thousands and thousands, if not millions, of our constituents. Dan Carter. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The UK is already a deregulated, low-tax economy with, with the most draconian workers' <laughs> rights in the whole of Europe, in which the richest are well rewarded. It would be bizarre if it wasn't after 12 years of a Tory government. But what that has not led to is the transformation of skills and training across the workforce. It's not led to rising wages, which are still less in real terms than they were before 2010. It has not lifted children out of poverty, and it's left us ranking 150th in the world for the investment that the Tories always talk about it. Can, can I ask the Chancellor a very specific question? Will he accept this fact? There is no correlation whatsoever between tax burdens and prosperity across high income countries. I don't accept his proposition that the level of tax is immaterial. I don't accept that. I don't believe that we can just tax our way to prosperity in, in the way that the socialists uh, claim. And I, I absolutely reject the idea that tax uh, doesn't incentivise economic activity. Paul Blomfield. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. After 12 years of Conservative economic failure, the Financial Times reported earlier this week that those on the lowest incomes in the UK are much poorer than their counterparts across the rest of Europe, 20 per cent below Slovenia, for example, while those at the top are among the wealthiest. Now, the Prime Minister has said she doesn't believe in redistribution. The measures announced today suggest she does but in the wrong direction, yeah. taking from those who have least and giving to those who have most. Yeah. Does he not recognise that the British people will see it exactly for what it is? Yeah. What I do recognise is that socialism and high tax doesn't work. And he and others have stood four times on a socialist platform. The British people have rejected them four times. And if they go back to the socialism, they will be rejected once again. Today we have heard the promise of accelerating energy infrastructure. Since I have been in this place, every MP in South Wales has been asking and demanding for a tidal lagoon in Swansea Bay. Now, will the Chancellor make that commitment to work with Welsh Government and Swansea Council to make tidal energy, green energy, in this country a reality? So I've done uh, my, uh, a lot in that regard, actually. I, we had a, we had a, a, ring, a ring fence. Uh, for tidal marine uh, energy, and there is a project in Scotland which is focused on that. The, the, the lagoon uh, project she mentions, I uh, looked at and wasn't uh, at the time value for money. But I'm open. I'm open to the concept. Oh, Patricia Gibson. Madam Deputy, mean that in Tory Britain, someone earning fifty thousand pounds will pay the same income tax rate. As a millionaire. Today's plans mean someone earning a million pounds a year will pay forty two and a half thousand pounds less income tax every year, and that is shameful. These plans were not in the Tory manifesto, uh, they don't have a mandate, and they certainly don't have a mandate in Scotland. The UK is already the most unequal country in Europe in terms of disposable income, according to the OECD. And after today, that inequality is guaranteed to widen. He may be proud of his announcements today, but what does he say to those who will now conclude that, just like Britain, the Chancellor's moral compass is broken? I reject uh, that implication. I reject that statement. We are absolutely focused in the Treasury and across government on helping uh, the most vulnerable, and that is why we had the most radical <laughs> energy intervention that any British government has ever made. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The reality is this is a class war budget. This is an ideological budget. This is about taking from the poor and giving to the rich. It's about lining the pockets. It is about them and us. And that party over there have said 
We do not care about ordinary people in this country. We care about piling on debts. We will make ordinary people pay while our chums in the city get rich. And will those chums spend the money on the economy? No. They will squirrel it away to tax havens around the world. That's what they have always done. Is this budget not a disgrace? So what uh, I want to reiterate is the fact that reversing the national insurance increase, which Labour supported, Labour supported, Labour supported, four, three months ago, Labour supported or voted against the increase in the national increase. I've reversed this. We've reversed this. That helps people. That helps people. Bringing forward, bringing forward the basic, the, 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 the one p uh, uh, cut in the basic rate helps people. That's not class war, Madam Deputy Speaker. Clive Afford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The proportion of income for the wealthiest over the last 12 years has actually gone up. So how come his economic miracle hasn't been working for the last 12 years? And where does his mandate come for this new era? Because it's worth reminding ourselves that two-thirds of the members on the benches opposite didn't vote for a, a candidate that supports the economic approach that the Chancellor has taken today, and only 43% four, of Tory members voted against it. So the choice today is clear. Who pays the bill? Is it the taxpayers, or is it these high-earning energy companies who have got excess profits? The choice is clear for the public, so why don't we put it to a general election, because he doesn't have a mandate for what he's doing today. So the, the choice is clear as to whether we should back uh, growth driven by the private sector or we believe that the state can tax its way to prosperity. That's a very easy choice to make, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's clear that taxing uh, and, and spending to prosperity is a failure. Laura Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The people of Putney, Roehampton and Southfields will see right through this budget for how little it will do for them. The only growth this growth plan will deliver is a growth in inequality. Yes. Does the Chancellor agree with his department, who, according to reports, have carried out analysis that forecasts that the UK oil and gas producers and electricity generators will receive as much as £170 billion in excess profits over the next two years? Shouldn't they pay their fair share? <laughs> that, that figure is not relating to um, taxable profits here in the UK, and it's not uh, remotely accurate. Deidre Brock. Uh, how and when will the Chancellor address the concerns raised by economists at the Resolution Foundation, the Institute for Government and the IFS that this package doesn't meet current fiscal rules? Um, as I said in my statement, we have a medium-term fiscal plan which will outline the medium-term approach to fiscal discipline uh, in, in the next few months. Zara Sultan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My constituents are terrified at rising bills. That's the word that they use, terror. Energy bills are still going to be double what they were earlier this year. Working class, but it's not a crisis for the Chancellor's class. Already making record profits, this is a banker's budget. It scraps the cap on bonuses, it slashes tax for the top 1% of earners and cuts tax on the profits of big business. Up and down the country, people are saying enough is enough. On their behalf, can the Chancellor tell me, does he really believe helping bankers and millionaire CEOs who, need, who needs the most help rather than working class people? Well, two things. The reversal of the national insurance uh, increase puts £330 a year on average to 28 million people and bringing forward uh, the uh, basic rate, the cut in the basic rate by 1p, uh, actually puts £330 uh, into uh, the average uh, person's pocket. That is not uh, a banker's bu a bu a budget. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Madam yeah. We've had a lot of words, but my constituents care about the numbers, and they will think that £18 billion is an awful lot of money. So what, Madam Deputy Speaker, are they going to get for it? The Chancellor stated in his statement that that would pay for business investment job creation and would raise wages. So I want to know precisely by how much real wages will rise by the end of this forecast period. We do, we don't run, this, is not, this is not the GOS plan. This is not the Soviet Union. I can't predict. 
I can't predict what the average wage will be, but I do know that one way to destroy the economic productivity of this country is to, is to if she will f- permit me, uh, is to uh, raise uh, taxes in the way that she's campaigned for over many, many years in her Corbynista days, whatever uh, that she was representing. That is not the way to, to grow e- e- the economy in this country. Richard Ford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, Please may I remind the Chancellor that uh, security is the first responsibility of government. And uh, please may I ask the Chancellor how today's changes in corporation tax might serve to reverse the cuts to the army of 10,000 soldiers, which will make the army the smallest that it has been since the Crimean War. So the corporation tax hasn't been changed, it's just been kept. Uh, at the level that, it's, that, that it is now. So there's no change in that. And in terms of defence spending, he will know that my right hon. Friend has committed to a 3% of GDP defence target uh, by 2030, recognising the changing nature of the threats uh, and the real importance of our armed forces. Yeah. Imran Hussain. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor this morning uh, promised new laws uh, to speed up the building of uh, uh, major infrastructure projects. So can I take from him this, that he's actually fully behind the Prime Minister and her promise to build the biggest infrastructure project in my constituency, the Northern Powerhouse Rail. And can I expect to meet with him soon after conference recess to immediately discuss plans to build it in full, including the Bradford stop? I'll be very happy to meet uh, the honourable gentleman to discuss infrastructure projects. We published a list of things that we want to accelerate, but infrastructure projects clearly are critically important to the growth plan. So I'd be very happy to meet him uh, at a time which is convenient. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can he just be clear with the House that the 2,500 figure for energy bills is for the typical or average household, and in fact many non-typical and non-average households will continue to pay more, and they will often be people with the greatest needs and in the greatest needs, and they will continue to pay more until there are structural changes to the energy market, including sorting out prepayment between gas and oil prices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he's absolutely right to say that in terms of the energy market, we do need to look at how it works. It, it's, it's, it's openly discussed the fact that the, the gas price actually determines the electricity price, where actually a lot of our electricity generation is non-fossil fuel based. It's, it's, it's based on renewables. And that's work uh, that I commissioned in Bayes that I hope to see uh, completed very soon. Chris Stevens. Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, what message does the Chancellor have for working people today who are having to utilise food banks, now considering utilising warm banks, and at Christmas time will have to utilise toy banks, whilst at the same time his government plans to introduce legislation to drag out pay negotiations, which will drag on for months, leading to the stagnation of wages. Isn't the SUUC correct when you describe his statement as a full frontal assault on working people in Scotland? It's nothing of the kind. What people will benefit from is a reversal of the national insurance uh, increase, the acceleration, the bringing forward of the 1p cuts in the basic rate. That's what uh, millions, tens of millions of people in this country will benefit from. Sarah Jones. Deputy Speaker, a young adult asked me yesterday whether I really believe that things in our country could get better, which is in direct... um, the direct opposite of my young adulthood, where it didn't occur to us that things would get worse. What is it about 12 years of Conservative government that have caused such poverty of hope? And what is it about this tired set of ideas that have sent the markets crashing that is going to work when all the other ones have failed? Um, We're focused on growth, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's through growth that the young person that she spoke to is going to get more opportunities and more benefits and actually have a much better funded public uh, sector. Richard Berger. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Tax cuts for the richest, bigger bonuses for bankers. This is the classic, classic trickle-down con trick. The wealth won't trickle down. In fact, it will be sucked up 
into fewer and fewer hands. So won't the Chancellor admit that that is what this is designed to do, that the Tories are acting like Robin Hood in reverse, taking from the poor and giving to the rich? Yeah. And isn't that appalling? at this time and people across the country, people out there are really suffering during this cost of living emergency. So there are three big measures which are helping people up and down, millions, tens of millions. Firstly, the energy intervention that announced by my right honourable friend uh, last week, uh, the reversal of the national insurance uh, planned increase and of course the acceleration, the bringing forward of the 1p cuts in, ba uh, in the basic rate. He should be welcoming those measures uh, and not playing to the gallery with his tired old uh, socialist yeah. rhetoric. Yeah. Yeah. Lira Hobhouse. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Access to dentists has reached a catastrophic low. One in five people are resorting to DIY dentistry with shocking stories from many of my Bath constituents. The only way to get a dentist appointment now is going private, which costs far more than any tax cuts will mm. offset. How will the ca tax cuts today offer my Bath constituents proper access to the dental care they need. Well, well what um, the growth plan will do is mean that as we grow our economy, we can get more tax revenue to pay for vital public services. That's a key part uh, and a key rationale of the plan. Okay. Margaret Ferrier. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the Chancellor on his appointment. Family-owned Equis ice cream in my constituency has been struggling with soaring energy bills. This century-old company will miss out on the government's support because their energy contract was renewed one day before the arbitrary cut-off following the collapse of their supplier. Can I ask the Chancellor and his colleagues to review this cut-off date to support small businesses? Obviously, I'd have to look at the specifics of the case, and I've just heard it uh, today, but if she um, corresponds with my department, we can, I'm sure, get back uh, with a timely answer to that question. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is not a growth plan for the constituents in my Liverpool Riverside constituency or the four million children living in poverty. The No Child Left Behind campaign is calling urgently on this government to tackle child poverty. So can the Chancellor commit to finding funding to roll out free universal school meals immediately and tackle childhood poverty? Uh, this is not a spending statement, but of course we take child poverty, uh, the vulnerable, extremely seriously, and that's why that was the basis of the energy of the energy intervention. Ruth Cadbury. Madam Deputy Speaker, firstly, could I thank the Chancellor for overturning his business secretary's statement yesterday on onshore wind by removing the ridiculous planning uh, restrictions that are unique to that sector. Talk about a one-day cabinet flip-flop. But secondly, can I warn him against removing normal planning rules on development and investment zones? When the Tory government removed the need for offices to housing uh, planning rules, uh, those conversions led to housing which were tiny rabbit hutches, no natural light, no basic services, and often away when they're on industrial estates, away from basic things like footpaths, bus stops, schools, and parks. Is this a dodgy developer's charter too? Not at all. The whole purpose, the whole principle behind the investment zone is a mutual consent. No investment zones will be imposed in any areas, and it will be very much up to uh, local councils to work out uh, which are appropriate sites for the investment zones. It's a cooperative exercise which will not be uh, the developer's charter that she describes. Christian Wakefield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, we were promised a big bang by the Chancellor. Instead, we've barely got snap, crackle and pop. Madam Deputy Speaker, we've got tax breaks for rich whilst he tells the next generation to pay off a debt that he is piling up. Truly the Chancellor of Sound Money. The Resolu Resolution Foundation said that the poorest 10% of households will gain all of £11 from this budget. That isn't a budget, of course. He is also raising the cap on bankers' bonuses while threatening to cut benefits for 120,000 people on universal credit. Why is he not looking out for those who are struggling the most and instead acting as the Chancellor for fracking donors and bankers? Yeah. Well, it's nice to see him in his uh, place on the other side. Um, uh, in splendid isolation there. 
<laughs> but, but I would remind him that the measures relating to national insurance and the basic rate do actually uh, help uh, the vast number of, a vast number of uh, constituents uh, on both sides of the House. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I wonder, what does it say about the government that at the height of a cost of living crisis, we appear to have a Chancellor who is putting pressure on the Governor of the Bank of England to increase interest rates, presumably on the basis that he considers that there's too many people right now who have got too much money in their pockets? And what also does it say about the priorities of the government, I wonder? Of all the groups that the government has rushed furthest to help, it's bankers suffering the indignity and privations of only being able to qualify for bonuses double their salary. We have an economic historian for a Chancellor. Isn't the legacy of today's statement going to be that for tens of millions of households of the length and breadth of the UK, he's going to make any notion of a fair economy history? Any cursory look at the history of this country shows that the way to deal with uh, debt, the way to deal uh, with um, cost of living issues is to grow the economy. And that's why we're 100 per cent focused uh, on that. Beth Winter. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As the TUC has pointed out, the Chancellor has said that we've been far too focused on redistribution and not on growth. But here he's been this morning making announcement after announcement that redistributes to the wealthy, lying in the pockets of the bankers and the fossil fuel companies. Yeah. People in my constituency of the Cannon Valley, indeed millions of people up and down the country in receipt of public um, pay, in receipt of social security benefits and pensions, have never benefited from any form of redistribution under this Tory government. All they've experienced is pay freeze, benefits cap and a freeze on the, um, the triple lock. Isn't it the case, as the overwhelming evidence does show, that the only thing that is growing is people's, um, people's debt, people's energy bills, and um, sorry? Oh, keep going, keep going. Order, 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 order! I think the Honourable Lady's probably got the message that she's taking too long, but I can't blame only the Honourable Lady because lots of people have taken too long. I've been quite lenient because we've got plenty of time today, but you know there's still a question of courtesy to the House. I hope the Honourable Lady will just put her question now, please. Absolutely nothing for the majority of people in the yeah. 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 economic yeah. order, order. Well, I politely asked the Honourable Lady to just put her question. Can't she just put her question? Has she put it? Because I didn't.